Uh, hi everyone, my name is Abraham Thomas and I'm uh, one of the founders of Quantum.com, which is or aspired to be, uh, aspired to be a search engine for data. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, I want to go on a slightly different tangent from some of the other talks. I want to talk about the thought process that went into building this and some share some of the because it turns out this is it's quite a fascinating uh, challenge. Um, so you know, talking to an audience of data analysts and data scientists and data professionals, you guys all know that the analysis, the science, that's the fun part. <clears throat> the data acquisition, that's the painful part. There's no shortage of data out there, right? There's millions of data sets on the internet, <coughs> but the problem is it's so fragmented, it, it takes hours of your time finding it, cleaning it, downloading it, merging it, synchronizing it, and then doing it all over again the next time you have to run some data. Um, and you know, this is like, <coughs> let's say, 80% of your time and probably 99% of the blood, sweat, and tears is just getting good quality data um, into your systems. So, obviously, why not build a search engine for data? That was kind of what we set out to do. Um, and if you're going to do something like that, you could do worse than learn from the masters. Uh, Google, of course. How does Google do it? Not that much I get. Um, well, everyone knows this, so I'm not going to spend any time on this, but typically the Google search process has four distinct stages. You start by crawling, um, visiting every web page in the world, you read what's on those web pages, you add them to the index. Uh, when the user types in a query, you kind of figure out how to rank them. And finally, you send the user off to the URL and uh, you know, lock them for devices. This works great for textual data, for uh, a whole bunch of things which Google has done really, really well. This fails horribly for numerical data. Why does it fail? Well, for starters, just crawling um, all the websites in the world doesn't really help. Only a minority of pages actually hold data. Um, very often the data is kind of uh, hidden behind uh, an API or a JavaScript dropdown or a form or some weird file format. Um, some, and just even identifying data is <laughs> reading, just reading words on a website and then adding it to an index, it doesn't work because data comes in too many formats and dumb index doesn't suffice. Ranking, well, your typical data set doesn't have a whole lot of keywords on it. And whoever links to a data set, right? <laughs> so you can't use uh, page rank or backdrop or any of those topological methods. So there's not enough link or semantic information to actually do a good ranking job. Finally, um, as you know, if you just get sent off to a URL, you haven't really solved the pain point because the user still has to do you know, the downloading and the merging and the cleaning and the sorting and the whole ETL thing. Suffice to say, if you're truly, if you're serious about building a search engine for data, you need a deeper process. You need to replace each of those classic Google steps, which you all know, with something, something more tailored to the data domain. For starters, you have to not just crawl websites, but identify that those small fractions of websites out there that hold numerical data, and furthermore, where on those websites the data is actually um, placed. You need to actually understand the data, understand how it's formatted, how it's structured, because only then can you do useful stuff with it. Um, if ranking and kind of the, the standard, uh, uh, if, you know, if ranking does work, you have to organize the data some way. In other words, you have to curate it, you have to classify it, you have to build data taxonomies and hierarchies. It's a completely different approach to discovery and exploration. Finally, you have to give the user a little bit more than just, here's your URL and you're, you're left to your own. You actually have to deliver usable data and you have to make sure that you're always delivering the latest version of the data because stale data is useless. Um, so that's kind of, that's the mission statement. Uh, let's see if it works. So let me just pull this up if I can. There we go. Um, I want to show you how we've done at Quantal. So this is Quantal.com. 
Uh, and as you can see, it's a very, very Google-like uh, interface, you know, big name and a big bank box. Let's type in, you know, with Fred Wilson, let's type in Bitcoin. Uh, what do you get? Well, this looks like a very classic Google search result. But it's not. This is not a list of URLs or web pages. This is an actual list of data sets out there on the internet that Quantum knows about and that Quantum understands really well. It understands well enough that it can give, uh, it can give rich, deep metadata, like the source, the type of data, the frequency, the provenance, uh, the fields available. Furthermore, when I click on one of these guys, the top result, you don't get sent off to some, oops, tutorial, that's a new system. Uh, you don't get sent off to some third party website. Instead, the quantum robot goes to the source, gets the data, cleans it up, formats it, gives it to you. In this nice, accessible, ready to use part. Every single one of the seven billion data sets on Quantum looks exactly like this. It doesn't matter who published it, where, how, what format, Quantum just kind of does all the work. And uh, best of all, there's this nice big red download button, which means that you as a user can get that data in whatever format you want. Excel, CSV, JSON, XML. Uh, you can get directly into the package of your choice, uh, Python, MATLAB. Even better, you can get it into uh, via an API call. So this means that you can build your own systems or platforms on top of Quantum. And this is actually something kind of cool, right? Because 7 million data sets, many of them without any API, without any structure, some of them in PDF files, for heaven's sake, and now there's an API around this. And uh, you've gone, essentially, from typing in the data that you want to getting it on your system in the tool of your choice in a matter of seconds. That's kind of um, the magic of quantum. And this is something that, um, well, let's just actually take a look at the raw data that came into this chart. And clicking right here, as you can see this metadata. That's your raw data. Think Google's going to find that? Uh, anyway, you, you all know what this is. It's just a JSON file. But as you'll see, there's not much. It was actually, actually hidden behind a graph on the source, so Google could not crawl it. Uh, there's no keywords at all, so Google wouldn't know what it was, let alone um, parse it. And um, Google had no parse. And there's no way to kind of bubble it up into a search result. So this is kind of the magic of having um, you know, a data search engine. That a search engine is specifically tailored for data. How did we do this? Did we actually solve all these problems? Mm, well, turns out that these are really, really hard problems. <laughs> right? Uh, so, I'm not, so now I'm like, I, I pulled the rabbit out of the hat, and now I'm going to show you that there's a false bottom, bottom magician hat. You know, people identifying data, you, you, people have tried computer vision and pattern matching, a whole bunch of other techniques, parsing data, all kinds of things. These are, I cannot emphasize how hard these problems are. Just to give you a flavor, right? Parsing, um, uh, which some of our friends from Nitiku were talking about, we have to handle different file formats. And you have no idea how bad these formats in some files can be. You have to handle different syntactic conventions. And those are kind of doable problems. But here's where it gets interesting. You have to handle structural problems is the data and rows or columns? What if you have multiple data sets on one page? What if you have one data set spread over multiple pages? What if you have nested data? What if you have gaps in the data? Your typical data file out on the internet suffers from having insufficient information and extraneous information. And you need to build a parcel that is clever enough to handle all that. And this is, at parsing, I would say, is actually the easiest of the problems. Um, identification is much, much worse. Organization, don't even go there. Um, it turns out that technology is not actually enough to solve this problem. Uh, technology does what it can, but, and this is a critical part of building a data search engine, you have to get some human input. Technology does what it can, humans do the rest. Um, and what does that mean? And Pity Fred's no longer here because he would like this. 
you are a search engine that you started out. <laughs> it's actually not a search engine anymore. It's just a search front end to what is really a data platform. A platform where technology does 90% of the work, but users actually contribute some percent. You know, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 1, I don't know. Um, but some amount of the, of the material that goes into powering the engine. What does that mean now? It means that you can't just rely on technology. You have to start thinking about behavioral effects and network effects. And that's kind of what we've done with Pondle. Um, I'm not going to understand and downplay our technology. We have actually done ma major, major advances in all four stages of that pipeline that I talked about, advanced state of the art. But we recognize that there are trade-offs. There are certain problems that human beings are really, really good at doing really quickly, like identifying data on a PDF page. There are some things that um, computers are really good at doing. So it's important to solve the right problems. After that, you also have to create the right incentives. Um, you, I, I, I hope that you all agree that there's some value to having all this data neatly accessible on one platform. And that is the right incentive. It's not, it's not about gamification, it's not about altruism, it's not about badges and social and following. You know, people have tried building data platforms with those incentives and different flavors of those incentives sometimes work, but we think that the ultimate incentive is selfishness, utility. Users put data on Quandle because that data is more useful to those users on Quandle than elsewhere. And you saw that with the Bitcoin data. With the Bitcoin data, I mean, okay, assuming that you had found it somehow or the other using Google, and assuming that you had passed it somehow or the other, you still don't get any of the magic benefits that Quandle delivers. Structure, persistence, API access, uh, integration into all your platforms, always up-to-date, transparent. This, if there's a secret sauce, if there's a magic formula, it's this last line down here. Data on Quandle has to be more useful. Um, that Bitcoin data set that I found, uh, that I pointed out, a user added it to Quandle. A user curated it, a user uh, created a topic page around it. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, yeah, it was nice that uh, uh, your friend mentioned it, but I wasn't going to talk about that page anyway, so. <laughs> But, but this is just one of, kind of hundreds of thousands of data sets on one completely added to the system by users. And this is where something magical happens, right? Because you start getting network effects. Um, you know, a platform with no data on it, yeah, whatever. A platform with 7 million data sets on it, if you're, if you're spending most of your analysis time getting data from Quantum, suddenly you have an incentive to add more data to the platform. It's all about critical mass. The critical mass is critical, and you know, like I said, we have seven million data sets on Quantum, but we kind of reached the stage where users are adding data, they're contributing, they're curating. There's a whole bunch of um, apps and startups and uh, other players building stuff on top of Quantum data acquisition layer, whatever you want to call it. So we're actually seeing this ecosystem around Quantum, and that's kind of that's the network effect personified. As one gets bigger, it becomes more useful. Um, and uh, really, that kind of that kind of sums up my talk. Uh, if I were to summarize very quickly, you know, searching for data is what it looks like. What it really is is it's a community, it's a network, it's a platform. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>